hey, I know everyone's uh, trying to transform medicine right now into an electronic version, and so I thought I'd record a quick video on how to get this done right now. It's a down and dirty short little guide on what do I do to make this happen. So first I'm going to talk about the two types of telemedicine. So the first thing that we have are video visits, and the second thing we have are store and forward. So video visits are general visits that involve video and audio connections. The patient can be anywhere at home, in the car, at work. There's so many options for them. With store and forward, the patient sends you information on the portal, and either you or your staff reply back. So those are the two types. So the basics that you need for telemedicine is number one, you need a video platform. So you can use a free video platform like uh, DocsyMe, which is free and HIPAA compliant. So that's a great option for patients um, that are seeing providers that are in independent clinics or have limited resources. If you are in a hospital system, chances are they're already using a video conference platform and they may already have the ability to utilize that platform and it could already be HIPAA compliant. Some options of, of those that I've used in the past have been Zoom, GoToMeeting, Chiron. So basically you just need to have them check to ensure that this is HIPAA compliant and that you can use them. I personally really like Zoom because you can make the, uh, the screen really tiny and you can move it around your actual screen which is really helpful when you only have one screen that you're using with both your EHR and your video platform. So the second thing that you're going to need is written consent. You can send this to them in the portal and they can write back that they agree or you can send it to them in any type of Word document that they can sign and send back. So that works really well with like GoToSign or something like that or DocuSign. Those are different platforms that you can use. A lot of the smaller EHRs actually have this embedded within their system where you can create a form and then actually just put the patient's signature on it and they'll send it back to you. Yeah, just have to make sure that you check your state laws because sometimes verbal consent is optional. So you can um, either do verbal consent or you can do written consent. You just need to make sure you know your state laws and you can just Google that, your state, and then telehealth laws. I forgot to mention that in some states, a patient can just respond back from a telehealth portal, um, like from their patient portal and say, hey, yeah, I totally am fine with this. And they just state, I agree. And as long as you have the telehealth consent, and that agreement in the patient portal in the chart, then it qualifies as consent. Also remember that in your consents, you should have risks and benefits of telehealth, like what happens if I can't finish the visit and I need to bring you into the office, or if I don't finish the visit and we're not able to get to everything and I can't contact you again, that I won't charge you for the visit. Those are the essential pieces to that consent form. If you'd like a sample request um, form, uh, excuse me, a sample consent form, just go ahead and message me and I can email that to you. The third thing you're going to need is an electronic medical record because you still have to document what's going on, right? If we don't do that, it didn't happen. And then the fourth thing you need is a provider. And I'm just saying provider in this terms, I guess I should say maybe a different word, a qualified healthcare person. So that can be a physician, a nurse practitioner, a PA, or an RN. In many states, they have autonomous independent decision making. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about how there's different types of qualified healthcare professionals and CMS actually does not differentiate between them and we'll talk about that in the future. So to my knowledge no state limits who can practice telehealth uh, and remember that if your RN is triaging for patients for COVID screening and they say you give them the COVID screening tools from the CDC and you don't feel comfortable or your state scope of practice uh, doesn't necessarily allow RNs to make independent decisions. If you're comfortable with them making those decisions or they're running them through you or you convert those screening tools into a, pro into a protocol, that the nurses can actually utilize that and you can just charge a 99211 that says you supervise the visit. And you just have to come to an agreement with your practice about what you want to do. So how do I code for a video visit? It's just like a regular office visit. So you use the same level of services, uh, whether it's an established or a new patient. I think the only thing you have to think about is it may be sort of difficult to use a new patient telehealth visit. I wouldn't recommend that for primary care offices, but like someplace like an urgent care where we're used to doing that, um, the hardest part is going to be how do I get that, that consent form to the patient and back to me. So just something to think about how you want to use that. Um, so you will then add a GT modifier, which is typically noticed by Medicare, or a 59, which is usually more commercial insurances, but if you're not sure, you can use either one. Currently, there's about 29 states that have laws mandating reimbursement regardless of the payer, so that should help you a little bit. And there's an e-visit uh, reference at the end that actually talks about 
what uh, states they are. Uh, so I really like that. eVisit has a lot of really good information, so it's a great place to peruse if you're needing some more information about virtual visits. So I'm just going to give a quick example here of a typical patient that you might see in primary care during this time. So a patient is seen for anxiety and depression. They filled a PHQ-9 and a G87, which you actually sent through the portal before the visit, or your MA can do it with them while they're rooming the patient. And you decide at the visit that you're going to prescribe an antidepressant, but you want to increase the dose. So we all know that's a 99214, right? So that's your code, a 99214. And then you'll just add the GT or the 95 modifier, depending on the insurance. But it's basically, if you're not sure, I would just add both of them. And of course, remember that your coding follows the same general rules for soap notes in regards to your HPI, your PFISH, your physical exam, and your medical decision making as to what level of service you determine. You just add the modifier. So how do I code a store and forward? So store and forward is just like responding to a patient, um, like a normal message in your patient portal. The two elements that are required to charge for this is a patient response and the clinician response. And remember that it's clinician, so a nurse, an MA, an RN, an LPN, a PA, anybody can respond as long as they're a qualified healthcare professional. And it's up to your clinic how you determine what you do with that or who responds. And then you just need to add a timestamp onto the encounter and drop the code. So remember that you may need to create a new encounter because when you're responding in a patient portal message, sometimes you have to create a new encounter. And the thing I want to encourage you to do is this is your time and you are using your medical degree for this. So you should get paid for that. And your staff can just actually send out the message and you can still charge for it, which is kind of nice, right? You're making the decisions but not having to do the, the actual documentation. That never happens. So use this if you can. So we'll just do two different examples. One is a five minute example and one is a 30 minute example. So here's my five minute example. You have a patient that messages you and I'm sure you guys have gotten a lot of these messages. I have a cough and a fever of 101.9 and I'm feeling a little short of breath but my inhaler is helping. I just got back from a cruise in Europe and I'm not feeling well. Do you think I have coronavirus? So you know by looking at the chart, this patient is a 55-year-old female with mild intermittent asthma. She's also got hypertension, so she takes lisinopril 20 milligrams a day. And you think, hey, she probably should get tested according to the CDC current, most current recommendations. Uh, so you message back, I think you should get tested for COVID-19. We have a drive through testing sites at our local ED, and I will let them know you're coming. You can actually uh, even paste a link in there so she can just open the Google Maps and she can um, get there with her phone. And then you just, you know, your general, if you feel worse, insert your protocol here for where she should go or if she needs to get reevaluated and how you're going to respond back to her. So this took you around five minutes to look at the chart, read the message, and respond. So you open a new encounter if you need to, to say, I spent greater than five minutes or more discussing, evaluating, reviewing records, and determining a treatment plan as documented in the record. That way you don't have to copy and paste everything into that encounter. Your code is going to be a 99211 because it's a timestamp, right? So just review your coding. Or if your MA responds back, uh, it's going to be a 99451. So you can use one of those. You must make sure you add the GQ or 95 modifier on them depending on the insurance or just add both of them. So now I'm going to look at a 30-minute visit. So same patient, same scenario, except for instead of you responding because you're super busy seeing all your patients, you have your nurse call back. The nurse spends like 30 minutes on the phone because the patient's extremely stressed out. And of course, she wants to tell her about her vacation and all of her symptoms. And then she has lots of questions about where she should go and what she should do. So the entire time of the discussion, the time spent reviewing the chart or maybe even talking to you as the provider is about 30 minutes for the entire clinical staff, right? Because they have to talk to you. you have, they should, the nurse is calling the patient. There's all this stuff happening. So this is your timestamp. I spent 30 minutes um, or more discussing and evaluating reviewing records and determining a treatment plan that's documented in the record. Now, if you document it and you do all these things, remember that the same thing applies as your level of service. So you have to have your qualifiers for your HPI and your review of systems and all that stuff. Potentially, unless you put the timestamp in, if you put the timestamp in, it's there's actually no... Um, true qualifications for what you have to have in there, but we all kind of follow the same thing. So if you're talking to the patient, you can technically charge a 99214 without any documentation except for that timestamp that I put up above. That's not usually looked at as best practice, so you may want to use the 99452, especially if it's the nurse that called. If it was you, you can use the 99214. If it's the nurse, you can use the 99452. Just make sure you add the GQ or 95 or both, depending on the insurance. 
So I've also added in just some different codes. Um, this is from a primary care perspective. So if you're in a specialty, I know there's been some nephrology questions. I don't have a lot of information for you on that. You may want to reach out to some others who are doing telehealth or your coders. They're great at this and they actually want to learn about, about medicine. So talking to them is really helpful. This is my SOAP template that I use. So you have your general headline at the top and then your data service. And then I just kind of take the dotted lines and insert that in between so it makes it very obvious to the coder and to anyone reviewing the chart that this was a virtual visit even though I've stated it at the top. I also just like to put a little line in there that I triage the patient and they're appropriate for telehealth. Some clinical pearls that I have learned um, is to always have a plan in place for a patient who needs help suddenly. I was doing a telehealth visit one time and I actually had a patient pass out in front of me and had to call 911 but it was kind of a you know I was like hey I need help in here and then the other MAs came in and they were like uh, there's no one in here. I'm like, the patient's on the screen. She passed out. So we had to call 911. So just have a plan for what you're going to do if the patient needs help or if they are not going to be able to be seen via telehealth. Um, so in that case, one thing I want you to remember is if you see the patient on telehealth and then they are come into the office and are seen within the next seven days, you need to take the time that you took for the telehealth visit and the time for your regular visit and add it together. So oftentimes that will go up to a 99215 and the first telehealth visit is not charged, it's only the time that the patient came in. So hopefully that makes sense to you. Another thing you wanna do is ensure that the area is private. A lot of the platforms will actually have a waiting room. So when the patient logs in, they go into their waiting room and then you would actually admit them. But the thing to remember is that uh, a lot of um, hospital administrators were pushing for me to do my telehealth visits inside of my office and I can't ensure that I'm not gonna have a patient something up or something up that maybe they wouldn't want to be seen on camera. Uh, so you can make sure that um, you're in a safe spot. I would recommend using an exam room. You can even have an iPad that just gets moved to your exam room as your telehealth. So you could have a, two screens and that makes things a little bit easier for you. Uh, just, just I would stay out of the offices. I don't know why that was thought as a good idea, but I kind of pushed away against that. Um, the other thing I was going to remind you is some telehealth platforms, you can actually minimize the screen. And if you take the screen and drag it up to where your camera is on your screen, when you're looking at the patient, it looks like you're looking in the camera and that makes them feel like they're actually looking at you. So that's just a clinical pearl. Make sure you actually look into the camera every once in a while, even though you're going to be looking at the screen and documenting. And there are some platforms where you can actually share your screen. So if you're using a shared decision aid or you wanted them to see their labs and you wanted them to see that on your screen, you can actually just share your screen with them. So that's really nice. Run it like a normal visit. It's not any different. Your MA can still ruin the patient and they can get quote unquote virtual vitals, right? So if you teach the patient to take their heart rate, you can count their respiratory rate. And if they get a stated weight or height, those all count as three vitals. If a patient has a blood pressure machine or a scale at home, you can also get weight um, and blood pressure. So that's something to think about. If you yourself are actually billing insurance, so everybody that's in a hospital system that has a biller, you can ignore this. For those of us that are in private practice and you're actually billing your insurance, remember that you change your location to two, not 11. Otherwise, it will get denied. Um, this was something I think I've said twice, just making sure that you might need to put a new encounter in and you might want to make a new encounter that has just like a charge only encounter where there's documentation and that you may need to work with your clinical staff on that. Um, and remember that you can still full bill for other things inside your visit. So if you do smoking cessation or you do a GAD or a PHQ, you can still drop your 96127 codes. So those are all things that you can do within the visit. These are my references. I tried, I will try to post this PowerPoint up so you can either copy and paste the references into your browser or I think that the links will work. So I'll try to make sure that happens. Some other things I just wanted to leave you with is I wish good luck to all of my fellow healthcare workers. This is going to be a really, really hard time for all of us, and this is the calm before the storm. One of the things I thought about was maybe we should all ask our communities to pitch in and make masks for us. We know we're going to run out of them, so why don't we ask them to help us? There's a lot of people sitting at home because their kids are out of school, and this may be a good way to help utilize saving our masks for the really sick people in the ICU and the emergency department. Um, the second thing I thought about was maybe, you know, after this, we really do need to keep our local and federal hospital administrators and our government officials accountable when this is over. 
when it's done, don't let it drop like, oh, it happened. We need to learn from this and move forward. And I know all of you think that. And it's, sometimes it's really hard to keep them accountable afterward. But I have said this over and over again in the last two weeks at my facility. So start saying it now so they know it's going to happen. Um, this is going to be a hard time. Um, I know a lot of us have already been through some hard times in our life, but know that it's normal to cry. It's going to happen. And to suspend judgment and support your coworkers through this, it's not going to be easy. And hopefully at the end, we can share some stories, give some hugs and move through this and that we're all here at the end of it. So thank you for watching this. I put my contact information on here. Feel free literally to text me at any time. You can email me. This is my website. Um, and I hope that you guys all make it through.